Praise the Lord and good evening, everyone. We honor the Lord Jesus Christ tonight for his goodness and his mercy toward us. And one verse comes to mind rapidly. Having therefore obtained help from the Lord, we continue until this day. We welcome you to our online Bible study and prayer. I am Bishop Horace Michael, pastor of the Beulah Tabernacle Church, and it is my pleasure to be with you all tonight. Thank you for spending this time with us. I'm going to ask you to take a moment to share this on your Facebook page, share this on your social media platforms, tag a friend, tag a neighbor, tag somebody that needs a word of encouragement from God tonight. The Lord has put a word in our spirit and has stirred it in my heart, and I cannot get away from it, and I believe that this is what God wants us to share with you tonight and what you need to hear. And so take a moment even right now and share this out if you would. Share it out. A night of power, a night of prayer, a night of God's word. Let's look to the Lord for a moment of prayer before we go any further. Eternal God, our Father, in the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your arm of strength and for your gentle touch. We thank you, Lord, that you watch over us, sitting high and looking low, but lifting us, Lord God, to the place we need to be in you. Even through your grace, you have raised us up together. Glory to God, made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you have forgiven us of our sins, that you have washed us clean through the precious blood of Jesus Christ and through the redemptive work of Calvary, we are now the sons and daughters of the Most High God. Hey, glory to God. Lord, speak to our hearts this night. Open your word up to us afresh. As we come before you, Lord God, looking for you to tell us, looking for you to share, looking for you to guide us as only you can. And so let your anointing be palpable. Let your presence be felt Allow us to leave this moment tonight together, declaring it was great for us to be here. Look on somebody right now, Lord God, that's going through a challenge, somebody that's facing a hard time. I pray, Lord God, that you would anoint us and let us say something to bless and encourage their hearts, Lord, someone that's outside of the ark of safety that needs to be brought in before it's everlasting too late. Help us, Lord God, to say a word that will touch their hearts to consider their ways and turn themselves to you, the only answer for today's dilemma. And so, Father, we commit ourselves into thine hand, spirit, soul, and body, the God that dries away tears and drives away fears, the God that lifts us and strengthens us and heals us and empowers us. To you be glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Ooh, my God, my God. Let's jump right in. Just want to give you a couple of uh, a very important announcement. This week, we have our Brooklyn Diocese semi-annual convocation, and we're so very excited to be hosting um, for our Friday night program, Apostle William uh, W.M. Fields, Apostle Michael Fields, our beloved brother, um, have worked together with him in ministry from the days of our growing up. Um, he being in the Bronx Diocese and we being in the Brooklyn, Manhattan, Long Island Diocese and matriculating through the process of being faithful servants, sons to our fathers in the gospel and servants to the body of Christ. And thank God that he is one of our new, newly consecrated apostles in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith Incorporated. We are so godly proud of him and grateful that the Lord will allow him to be with us for Friday night, November the 3rd. We'll be at the Refuge Church, Far Rockaway, uh, 1837 Mott Avenue in Far Rockaway, Queens, pastored by Elder Rasan Staley. Uh, Pastor Emeritus is our beloved Apostle Leroy Joseph Sr. And so let's all gather there. We're looking for a high time. 7.30 is the service on Friday. And speaking of the program, we're going to be gathering together at 6.30 with our presbyters meeting. Um, all of our elders and ministers, and then our women's council will be in, in a simultaneous session at 6.30, and we'll come together at 7.40 for our evening worship service, again, with Apostle Fields being our keynote speaker. 
Um, we're looking for God to come and bless in a mighty way. And as it is our model for our convocations, the Friday is an evening worship experience. And then Saturday, we spend time in a teaching ministry. And we're looking forward to welcoming District Elder and Lady Donna Moya, District Elder Sylvain Moya and Lady Donna Moya coming to us from Virginia. We're looking forward to God blessing us. My God, it's just going to be a powerful time of worship and word. And we're going to be focusing on Saturday on the theme, going to war for our families under the overarching theme, positioned to accomplish God's mission. Every single one of us has a mission on our lives and God has empowered us and positioned us to be able to accomplish it for his glory. Where you are right now, you may not realize it, but God has got you right where he wants you and right where he needs you and right where he's going to use you. And we want to give you words of instruction and words of inspiration through the preaching of the gospel and the teaching of the word of God. Oftentimes it's been said of old that we preach to reach and we teach to keep, giving foundation and opportunity for engagement with the facilitator. And we're looking for a high time in the Lord. Um, we'll have a special ABYPU, our Armor Bearers Young People's Union workshops as well. So we'll have adult workshops and we'll have workshops designed for our young people. And then at 4 p.m., uh, 3 o'clock, we'll have a lunch. We'll break for lunch. Saturday starts at 12 noon. Um, then 3, we'll break for lunch. And then 4 o'clock, we'll come together for our afternoon worship, having one of our very own sons in the gospel uh, coming back to be with us, coming to us from Connecticut and the Urban Hope Refuge Temple Church, Refuge Church, none other than Elder Brian Martin. He'll be back with us for our Saturday uh, late afternoon worship experience. We're looking forward to the Lord meeting us there and allowing us to have a good early evening where we'll come out saying it was great for us to be there. So come one, come all, share this far and wide. Let's pack the house and be a blessing. Let's come and expect God to speak to our hearts. And I promise you, if you come with that expectation, you will not leave disappointed in the name of the Lord. Well, tonight, we're going to be opening up our Bibles. I need everybody to turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Um, I was in this chapter, in this book, um, for the weekend, and I want to certainly thank and praise God for a powerful sat Sunday worship experience with Bishop Malcolm Mitchell, Mitchell um, Lady Carla Mitchell and the Saints of God at Mission Church in Somerville, Massachusetts. Some of you may remember Mission Church as a church that was formerly pastored by Apostle Henry Moultrie. Well, Apostle Moultrie has turned over the reins of leadership, pastoral leadership to his son of the gospel, uh, Bishop Malcolm Mitchell, who was consecrated as a bishop at the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ Holy Convocation in 2017. I was fortunate to be a part of that event as well, along with Bishop um, Gordon Sweat. Bishop uh, Sweat, Bishop Mitchell, and myself were consecrated in, in July of 2017. And we went to be with Bishop Mitchell celebrating his 16th pastoral anniversary. He and Lady Mitchell were such incredible hosts. And the entire saints, the entire congregation of Mission Church made us feel right at home. They blessed us going in and blessed us coming out. And I want to thank and praise God for those members of Beulah Tabernacle that took the time to drive out there with us. They didn't count it robbery to be there with us. I love you and thank God so much for your support. Lady Michael even taught a Sunday school class there for their women's department, and we had a wonderful time. Um, and so this has been resonating within my spirit. Um, and I want to speak to you tonight out of this because I believe that there are some that are still yet facing challenges with faith, still cha facing challenges with their trust levels. And the Spirit is just telling me to tell you just to take the limits off God. Now, I'm going to tell you something about this message. Um, we were just we just returned, I guess, um, around maybe 11 o'clock Sunday when we finally got back home to New York and pulled in. But I'm telling you, the enemy did not like the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the mighty move of God that took place in, in Massachusetts. Uh, I won't go into any details, but we had uh, under somewhat of an attack for the last couple of days. 
and I'm not giving up on this word because this word is moving mountains. It's shaking something up in the spirit realm. And so I want to get into it in Jesus name. I, I just need, um, I need a couple of readers tonight. I'm going to keep this up. Um, I need a couple of readers because I want people to see this. And so um, what I really want to do is start from verse number 14. So I need some readers. Um, we're going to read from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. So I, I'm, I'm going to need some folks to do some reading tonight, uh, beginning at chapter uh, verse number 14. Uh, I need, so what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to ask you to put the number of the verse in. We got verse uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Put the number of the verse in. We got quite a bit of people in. We got, okay, wonderful. People are putting the numbers in. Thank you so much. This is just what I need you to do. Please continue to put the number in. In, in Zoom, we can see who's put numbers in so people can see what's been taken and what's been left. Amen. You all are doing a wonderful job. Keep it up. We, I need somebody uh, for uh, 17 and eight, uh, 17, 20 and 21. 17, 20 and 21. <laughs> okay. And I just need somebody for 21 and be ready to go. God bless you. Okay, let's go. Verse number 14. So Ephesians is the book. It's a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul um, while he was in Rome in prison. This was one of four um, letters that he wrote to different churches, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And these four letters or epistles have been known and categorized as the prison epistles. The Apostle Paul was one of the greatest proponents for the Christian church and one of the strongest, one of the greatest theological minds. It's incredible how God used him at the stage in the beginning time of the church being founded. He was there um, actually making it hard for those in the church in the very beginning as a uh, antagonistic persecutor of the church. And as such, he was there witnessing Stephen being stoned, holding the coats for those that were witnessing or that was stoning Deacon Stephen. And so this young man who actually grew up very uh, uh, staunch Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, sat at the feet of one of the leading scholars, Jewish scholars of his day, Gamaliel. And it's no question and no surprise that he became such a um, powerful orator, powerful presenter, powerful defender of the faith, powerful apostle to the Gentiles. And we thank and praise God that he has made that kind of impact upon the body of Christ and given us a foundation upon which we are building on today. And that foundation primarily was the fact that he expressed, expressed how the Jews and the Gentiles come together in one body. And so we want to take a little um, trip through the word of God, Ephesians chapter three, beginning at verse number 14. I think Sister Lynette's got that. And uh, I just got a little visitor that just came in here. And I'm not sure where my daughter is because Harmony just decided to come into Bible study. Bless her heart. And so, uh, Sandra, uh, uh, Harmony, it's going to go away. We're going to pivot to the word. So let's go. Um, Sister Lynette Alexander, please unmute verse number 14. Good evening, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Amen. God bless you, dear. Good. Okay. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Correct? The King yes. James Version. Yep. King James Version. I'm coming. Give me a little time because it went to 14. I'm coming, sir. Don't worry. I'm coming. I have I have the word. Amen. Good. <laughs> For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is very important. And thank you, Sister Alexander, because... One of the things that we get out of this, and this is why I wanted to start here, is because this is talking about Paul praying for the people of God at Ephesus. Ephesus was the first church out of the seven churches in Asia Minor that we find John being instructed to write to in the book of Revelations, chapter 2. Chapter 2 and 3 chronicle for us 
seven particular churches in Asia Minor that from a historical point of view, when those when those churches are looked at and they are lined up with church history, it is interesting to see the parallel between what was going on in those seven churches and how church history lines up with those seven churches. And so the church of Ephesus was the first church to which John was instructed to write to the pastor of that church, to the angel of that church. And it was a very hard letter because quite honestly, the church of Ephesians had fallen to a place where they lost their first love. Um, the fire had gone out. Their love for God had diminished. And I want you to understand that if you don't keep that fire going, my God, I feel something right there. If you don't keep that fire going, the enemy will try to put it out. You got to keep the fire going. God gave you the fire. You got to keep that fire going, that passion for God, that love for God, that zeal for God. And so the apostle Paul is praying and perhaps he even is praying prophetically under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, understanding what's going to befall them in the historical unfolding of time. And so he prays, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for this cause. And it's important for you to understand that he wants them to come to a supernatural understanding. And this understanding will be uh, further developed in the subsequent verses. Let's go on. Verse number 15. Missionary Jones has that. Okay, verse number 15. Ah. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. I'll call the whole family in heaven and his name. All right. Thank you, dear. Something is going on with the audio, but... I want you to, to, to know this. It says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. It is important to understand that we bear a name. We were not just created by the Lord Jesus Christ, but we are called to bear his name. The name goes on because it denotes ownership. It denotes identity. It denotes quality and value and something that that name embodies. Wherever that name goes, there's a weight that goes along with that name. Wherever that name is, there's a level of influence, glory to God, because of that name. Where that, Whatever that name is, that name, if you're talking about in, in the industry or in the world's economy, a good name, I mean, the scripture says a good name is, is rather to be had than gold. And it's talking about reputation. And so when we talk about the name that we bear, it underscores a reputation that we carry. As children of God, we carry a name that has value, that has worth, and that represents the power of the kingdom of heaven. Glory to God. That name is Jesus. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that is made. The scriptures go on to say, in him is life, glory to God. And this life is the light of men, and the light shines in dark places, and the darkness cannot put it out. The power of the name of Jesus is an inextinguishable name. You cannot put the fire of that name out. Oh, glory to God, that the brilliance of the light. He is the physical manifestation of the invisible God, the image of the invisible God. Hebrews chapter one talks about that. He talks about Jesus as being the image of the invisible God, the God who in sundry times and divers manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath made heir of all things. 
Bible talks about him being the expressed image of the person of God. Woo, glory to God. I'm, I'm feeling something here. And so when we talk about the name, let's understand that Jesus is that name. And the quality in that name is upon you. Glory to God. Most of the time, the product is designed to be consistent with the reputation attached to the name. And so people look to the product to represent the quality of the name. We look to God to empower us to reflect the power of that name. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. The power that's in us, the Bible says, and the apostle Paul talked about it, that we have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. And so we bear a name of power. This is why you gotta take the limits off. We bear the name of virtue. This is why we live virtuously. We bear the name of our holy God. Ooh, the God who was in Christ Jesus, reconciling the world unto himself. We were sinners. Christ was holy. Christ took on sin that we might take on his holiness. And all those that come to God by faith through what Christ has done, whoo, become born again, born of the water and born of the spirit. And by virtue of this new birth experience, the apostle Paul says, if any man be in Christ or woman, we are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's because we are bearers of the name. The name has made a difference. Ooh, glory to God. The name makes the difference. When you go into the store, and a lot of times people are not too, uh, uh, a lot of people, a lot of folks want to, they want to wear things that's got a label, name on it, a manufacturer's name, that kind of thing. But there's some people that are a little bit more um, um, low key. They want the quality, but they don't need the name to be tagged all over the garment or the article or whatever it is, the article of clothing or the item. They want the quality. And they understand that the, the name represents quality. And I think that it's important for us as, as children of God, as the body of Christ, to understand that we bear a name that has the highest quality attached to it, has got the greatest power that's attached to it. And the way that we reflect all of that is by living up, walking worthy of the vocation that we are called. This walk, mm, mm, mm. this walk is not glorious. Too many people make the Christian walk glorious and they want to make it as if, you know, we're just walking on, uh, on, on air. We're floating on clouds. There's no problems, nothing going on wrong, all that kind of thing that we have no problems in life. But the devil is a liar. Anyone that will live godly in Christ Jesus must suffer persecution. And I think that's why the enemy has been fighting, uh, fighting us, fighting my, my family these last couple of days because of the impact that was made when we went to be a blessing. But I want you to understand this, that the name is power. The name is protection. And the name protects us to fulfill divine purpose. Lord have mercy. Let's go on. Verse number 16. The whole family in heaven and earth is named. Everything was made by him. Verse 16. Good night, everybody. Praise Verse the Lord. 16 says, I, I'm sorry, I don't have it in the KJV. I'm sorry, this is my Bible. Bless her, um, Jesus. Read on, daughter. Says, Read on. I'm in a physical Bible. It says, I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower with, he, I'm sorry, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Should I read 17 as well? Um, no, let's hold on to the first 16 for a moment. The okay. King James Version reads this way, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. This is a part of the Apostle Paul's prayer for the saints at Ephesus. 
this letter was somewhat of a circulatory letter. In other words, it was to be passed from one church to the next. It was certainly one that was passed to Laodicea. And I think there's some, it's an interesting uh, observation that Ephesus was the first church in Revelations chapter two that John was impressed upon to write to the shepherd of that church and Laodiceans, Laodicean church, the church at Laodicea was the last church um, that he was impressed upon to write to. Um, but what Paul is praying here for these believers is that they would be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now, understand, he's writing to a body of believers. They're spirit-filled. And so what he's really writing for them to come to is to come to revelation knowledge. You already have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have the strength of God. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. It is Christ of God that worketh in us both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. And I, I just want somebody to understand. When we look at verse number 16, I want you to make a note, God is at work. The reason that we can take the limits off God is because God doesn't work only on the outside. He works on the inside. My God, I wish I had a witness. He's working on the out inside. A song, we used to sing a song a long time ago. Jesus on the inside working on the outside. But let's understand that nothing can happen on the outside until something has taken place on the inside. And when the Apostle Paul is praying for the saints at Ephesus to, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, understand he wants them to come to a realization of something that they already have. The Apostle Paul was challenged in a period of time in his life where he was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. He came to a conclusion that it was better for him to go through this challenge because when he asked God to relieve him of it, when he asked God to take it away, the Lord told him no. And Paul didn't ask once or twice, he asked three times. And the final, in the final analysis, God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Somebody needs to understand that what's operating on the inside is the grace of God, the grace of God to keep you rooted and grounded, the grace of God to keep you centered and focused, the grace of God to help you to understand that the beginning is not the end. And that God is working some great things in you, through you, for you right now. Oh, God. Y'all got to pray for me tonight because my granddaughter is thinking she is in Poppy's playground. And I don't understand what in the world. Lord have mercy. Y'all pray for me tonight, Jesus. <laughs> what I want you to understand is that there is something working inside of you right now. This is why we are able to endure hardness because God is at work. This is why we're able to hold our heads up high when we are being buffeted because God is at work. Troubled on every hand, my God, perplexed but not in despair, cast down but not destroyed. We are, you know, there are so many things that go on in the believer's life that most people would never understand how in the world you made it. God, woo, you have gone through so much, but you are a living witness that greater is he that is in us than he that, that that's in the world. You are the witness of the strength of God working on the inside, and oftentimes that strength is manifested in us learning how to hold our peace and let the Lord fight our battles. Now, it doesn't mean that we take a passive role, but it means we take a yielded role. My God, we're not passive, we're yielded. Somebody put that in the chat. We're not passive. There's nothing passive about the spirit-filled life. Life in the Holy Ghost is dynamic. It's active. 
It is really exciting. There's nothing passive about it. But for us to get the maximum out of it, this is what we got to do. Jesus put it like this. If any man will come after me, he must first deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me daily. You do this, and you'll understand that the flesh does not have the last say in your life. Your feelings and emotions, although real, very real, and they are elements of our humanity, but they do not have the final say. Take the limits off God. I know we have feelings. I know we have emotions. Those are some things that actually cause us to be very godlike. Praise the name of God. God has made us with emotions. God has made us with feelings. But God has put into every one of us a measure of faith so that we can do like Mark 12 says, have the faith of God. Lord, have mercy. We got to go on. Strengthen by my, with might by his spirit. This strength comes from God. The reason we can take the limits off of God is because we have an insight as to who God is. We have an insight about God. We're not making decisions based on nothing. Our decisions is based upon the God we know. Hey, hey, I wonder if I got anybody out here that knows God for yourself, not for the preacher, not for the teacher, not for the first lady or the missionary, but do you know him for yourself? Because when you know him, ah, God, can't nobody make us doubt the God we know. Do you know him? Let's go to verse number 17 real quick. I think Sandra has it, but I'm not even sure if she can get back to it. Verse number 17. I, I got it. I got it. All right. Come on, verse, daughter. Verse number 17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Thank you. Hold that right there. <laughs> Understand the connection between verse 16 and 17. The strength in the inner man that we may dwell, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Understand here now, our faith in what Christ has done is the foundation for our strength. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. For anyone that comes to God must first believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith first. Faith first. First faith. And with that faith dwelling in our hearts, whew, the faith being the substance of things hoped for, Hebrews 11, verse 1, the evidence of things not seen, this faith dwelling in our hearts being causing us to be rooted and grounded in love. These are all qualities and these are all virtues that come to us by God, through the Holy Ghost. This love is not uh, uh, the kind of love that a man has toward a woman or a parent has toward a child or a friend has toward a dear friend. It's not erotic, erotic love. Uh, it's not uh, familiar love, Philadelphia, filios love. It is agape love. And the only way you can get agape love is to have the Holy Ghost. You cannot love like God without the spirit of God. And with the Holy Ghost, we can love like God wants us to love. Woo! I want you to understand, somebody that has the Holy Spirit here needs to understand that you can love the unlovable. It doesn't mean that you agree with their behavior or their decision or what they do or what they say, but thank God. The love that God has extended toward me is the love that I can extend toward you, where God looked beyond my faults. He didn't hold me captive to my past. Woo! He set me free from it. He didn't hold me in bondage to my behavior. 
he gave me a way out. For the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. I want you to understand that where, where Paul is building up to this incredible crescendo that is articulated in verses 20 and 21. We're building up there that you may be, um, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. We trust him. We know him whom we have believed in, and we are persuaded that he's able to keep that which we commit unto him against that day, that we may be rooted and grounded in love, rooted and grounded. This is talking about deep glory to God. The thing that we need that goes deep. Roots talk about depth. And, and in Christ, depth comes through suffering. You can hear a pin drop right there. Depth, how deep. Depth comes through understanding not only the power of the resurrection of Christ, but the fellowship of the suffering, that we might be made conformable to his death, that we might be following the pattern of such such yieldedness and submission that death does not threaten us if it's presented. The same way that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah refused to bow to the threatening behavior of King Nebuchadnezzar. They said, we are not careful to answer thee, O king, in this matter. For the God that we serve is able to deliver us out of your hands, out of the fiery furnace. But if he decides not to do it, if he decides that this is how we got to go out of here, if God decides that this is the way we come to death, we are still not going to bow to your statue, to the image that you set up. I want you to understand the Apostle Paul, even as he was in Rome, he was actually in Rome uh, uh, waiting to face um, Nero. And uh, as you may know from the history of Paul's life, he actually was decapitated for his testimony. He was insistent that he wasn't going to budge. And he wrote to the believers at one point and said, you have not yet resisted unto blood, defending and standing up for the faith. But some have. Martyrs have given their lives. That, that's what a martyr is. They gave their life for the cause. Fox's Book of Martyrs talks about Christian martyrs throughout history. Men and women that loved God unto the death, following the admonition, be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. So Paul is saying here, as we pivot back to verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Love is the is the, the the soil matters. Whatever soil a seed is planted in, that soil matters. And, and some people are allowing the soil of bitterness to rule in their hearts. The soil of inconsistent living, the soil of inconsistent giving the soil of complaining and murmuring. Your soil matters. When you read the parable of the seed and the sower, there was no problem with the seed. The problem was the ground, the soil. And what Paul wants us to be rooted and grounded in, he wants the soil to be the love of God. Woo! Being rooted and grounded in love. Verse 18, come on, who's got verse 18? My God, Dr. Marbury, verse number 18. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. One second, um, Bishop. All right. Okay, number 18. Yes, dear. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the bread and length, and depth, and height. Very good. When you are yielded to the place 
where you are allowing God's love to rule in your spirit, you will come to a knowledge, a multidimensional knowledge of God's love. A multidimensional knowledge of God's operation in your life. Love is the operation of God. My God, you need to put that down. Love is the operation of God. Agape love. Agape love is the operation of God in our hearts. And the Apostle Paul is saying here that it has multiple dimensions. It's not one dimensional. Hey, hey, glory to God, that there is breadth to it. It's broad. It's wide. It's got length. It's long. It's not short. It's got depth. It goes down deep. It's got height. It goes up high. Hear me what I say. This is this is the substratum that we are built in, built upon. This is the, this is the super glue. It's the super ground. It's the super ground. It is spiritually, supernaturally empowered for us to experience whew, the breadth, the broadness, the length, the longness, the depth, the deepness, the height, the highness. Glory to God. God's love, God's operation in our lives is so multidimensional that it has no limits. It's not just broad, it's broad with no limits. Every one of the dimensions spins off into a space that has no limits. The breadth of it has no limits. The length of it has no limits. The depth of it has no limits. Woo! The height of it has no limits. And, and, and here we go. Verse number 19. Somebody come with that quick. Glory to God. This multi multidimensionality of God is a revelation by the Holy Ghost. And I want you to see it. Verse number 19. Who's got that? Woo! Hmm. Hmm. Dr. Marbury, I think, has got that. Come on, Dr. Marbury. My God, my God. Is she there? I think she... Come on, Dr. All right, I'm going to read it. I, I see you there. I'm not sure if you can cannot unmute for some reason or the other. Verse number 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that ye may be filled, here we go, with all the fullness of God. To know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Now, it is almost inconceivable for us to know something that passes knowledge. But what Paul is saying to the saints at Ephesus is that this is something that you get to know more of over time. And it has no, you cannot exhaust it. You cannot exhaust it. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. It's more than what you can comprehend. It goes beyond your ability to comprehend. And so this is why some people struggle with God's favor that's on your life. Because some people will judge you based upon what they know of you. God doesn't judge us based upon what he knows about us because he knows everything there is about us to know. You don't know some of the things about us, about me. I don't know some of the things about you, but God knows everything about me. He knows everything about you. But yet and still, whew, he chooses to put his love on us. The Bible says that when we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. Why? Because God commended his love toward us. 
God, God's love had, God didn't give love, agape love, a choice. He sent it. Agape love follows the commands of God. You want to know if you're operating in agape love or not? Ask yourself this. Is your love following God's commands? If your love is following God's command, then you are operating in agape. Lord, have mercy to know the love of Christ. This knowledge is intimate, experiential, and ever unfolding. Intimate, experiential, and ever unfolding. Somebody put that in the chat. Ooh, glory to God. This love blows our minds. This love, you it it is completely un extinguishable. You cannot put it out. It is unexhaustible. You cannot run it out. God's love chases after us. Hey, his love chases after us. He comes after us with his love. And there's nothing like a God who's operating in love. God's greatest gift to humanity, hey, hey, was an expression of his love. Ooh. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish. He so loved. He loved intensely. He loved intentionally. Intense intentionality is the love of God. My, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Put that in the chat. Intense intentionality is the love of God. It, it, it pursued us. It found us. We were the ones that were lost. But his love found me. His love pursued me. His love is pursuing you right now. He's chasing after you. Hey, my God, he, he, he loves you. God loves you, my friend. God loves you, my brother. God loves you, my sister. He loves you, son. He loves you, daughter. All of this is because he loves you. All of this is because he loves us. Verse 19, to know it intimately, intentionally, Ooh. transformationally. Somebody put that in the chat. This kind of knowledge is not a knowledge to leave you the way you are. Even this lesson tonight. Out of these few verses from Ephesians chapter 3, this knowledge is for transformation, not just information and inspiration, but for edification that leads to transformation, to build you up. To edify means to build up. Transformation talks about a change. You cannot be changed without God's hand building you up. This, this edifying, when something comes that edifies you, it finds you in a place of need and it meets that need. It strengthens you in the area of the need. To edify, to build up. You can't build up something that's built up already. There's an area in you where God is working on right now. He's building you up right now. He's strengthening you right now in spite of what you face. And let me get to verse 20 and 21 with great haste. I, I don't want to take it away from the readers that volunteered. Verse number 20, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Woo. Now unto him mm -hmm. that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could 
acts or think according to the power that worketh in us. Ooh, the Apostle Paul, he, he leaps off of verse 19. And what he gives us at the end of verse 19, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. God is not leaving anything out of this plan for you. He's got a full plan. He's got you covered. Somebody put that in the chat. God's got me covered. His fullness is extended to me. Everything he has belongs to me as his son, as his daughter. My father, it's his good pleasure to give us the keys to the kingdom. The fullness of God. He wants me to know full, to be satiated, to have no empty space, to be complete. And the Holy Spirit wants you to receive this word for revelation to understand that we are, that in Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we are complete in him. This completeness, this growth and development, this maturity that becomes greater and greater with our yieldedness to the love of God operating in us brings us to a place where no excuse can hold us back. Nothing from our past can pull us back. No weapon formed against us can prosper and no demon can hold us down from what we did because the God that we serve has forgiven us of what we have confessed. There is no dark corner. There is no secret closet. There's no skeletons there because I've done confessed it. I've confessed my sins to God. And what I've confessed to God, you can't blackmail me with. You can only blackmail a person with something that they don't want nobody to know about. And the person that needs to know about me is God. He knows everything there is to know about me. And I have confessed my heart to him. I've given it to him. I have confessed unto him. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what I have confessed to God, you can't blackmail me with it now because I've already confessed it. And God is my judge. I got to stand before. And if I, if God, if God be for me, if God be for you, let's understand God. Hey, hey. And this is what Paul is trying to sow in the hearts of the believers as he jumps in at this high point of verse 20. The conclusion of the matter is now unto him, not tomorrow. Not next week, right now, now unto him. I release it to him now. I trust him now. Oh, glory to God. Somebody just open your mouth and say now. I'm not putting it off for tomorrow. I'm praising him. When am I praising him? Now. Glory to God. You can even say right now. Put it in the chat. Right now. Put it out there. Put it out there with exclamation, an exclamation point. Right now. Put it out there right now. Right now is when I'm going to give him praise. Right now is when I'm going to give him glory. Right now is when I'm going to make my confession known. I believe God and that it shall be just as he said, trust and obey. Believe him and say, I believe, I believe God. Now unto him, now. Now, this is the moment. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. This is the moment, my brother. This is your moment, my sister. This moment is a God-orchestrated moment, but it's got your name on it. Will you respond to God by faith now and give him glory? Will you respond to God by faith now and thank him in advance for that petition that you have put out? My God, even greater than the petition is the revelation. My God, many people Follow hard behind God for the manifestation of material. But will you take that same posture hey, with, the, with greater fervency just to know him for revelation? Because when you have revelation, 
you can be, you're unstoppable. The unstoppable believer is the believer that walks with a revelation knowledge of God. Hear what the scripture says. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. This power has come to us because of love. It's love power. Love power is creative. Love power is restorative. Love power can change the world. Oh God, y'all though. Love power can heal a broken marriage. Love power can cause children and parents to be reconciled. Love power can heal a multitude of sin and cover a multitude of sin. Love power. Somebody say love power. According to the power. See, a lot of times people think about power as the physical ability to, ex uh, the ability to exert force. That is a part of it, but the other side is the power to yield to God. The power of obedience to God's word. See, it was obedience that caused Jesus to go to the cross. He loved us, but what was be what came before, what was what he did, what what was more important than his love for us was his obedience to God. When the rubber met the road and the challenge of what was facing him came upon him almost as a, as a, as a full blast, when he came to that pivotal point of decision, Lord have mercy. Woo! Because Everybody's got to get to the place where you got to make up your mind. When Jesus was at that pivotal place where it was time to decide, hey, glory to God. He said, if this cup can pass from me, that'd be fine, but not my will, but thine be done. His obedience to God was greater than his love for us. He obeyed what God told him. He said, my father loves me because I, I do what he says to do. And the devil, check this out. The devil has no place in Christ. He could find no place, no Achilles heel, because he always does those things that please the father. And he's talking about not the things, but the operation behind it, which is obedience. Obedience pleases God. God wants obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And to listen to God, it's greater than all the sacrifices you can give to God. Ooh, the power that worketh in us. Verse number 20. I'm sorry, verse number 21. I, I, who, who's got verse 21? Unmute and read, please. I think Dr. Marbury's got that. Come on, Dr. Marbury. Bless you, dear. Okay. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And so Paul reaches a climax. And I want you to see the climax. The climax is giving God glory. Climax, the, the pinnacle, the arete, the high point. It's not in you getting a new job. It's not you earning a six-figure income. It's not you buying a new house or getting a new car or finding the man of your dreams, marrying the woman of your dreams. That's not the high point. That's not the pinnacle. That ain't the top. 
We were created to give God praise. Despite what we face, despite the challenges, and everybody has had challenges in our life, in their lives. All of us have had challenges. And these challenges often cause us to second guess things, these experiences. You may have been hurt by someone. You might have been let down by somebody. You, you may have failed yourself. And those experiences may cause you to second guess what can be done. And what God wants to do, he wants you to see how letting him come into your life can take away all the excuses. Letting him rule in your heart by love whew, will cause you to get to a place where you will take the limits off God. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. All the days of my appointed time, I will wait until my change comes. Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. He started off the book of Psalms by saying, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, in the precepts, in the teachings, in the doctrines, and in God's law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. When God was bringing Joshua into Joshua's season, ah, glory to God, he told him to be strong and of a good courage. He said, this book of the law shall not depart from thee, but thou shalt meditate upon it day and night, for therein shall thou make thy way prosperous, and therein shall you have good success. Have I not told you, be strong. Woo, my brother, my sister, now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask for thing according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory. God wants glory out of your life. He wants glory out of the words that come out of your mouth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. God wants glory out of your walk, how you conduct your life. He calls us to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. This is in the book of Ephesians. He wants to be glorified in how you learn how to stand and trust God and let God take you through a thing. Oh, God, I got to let you go. But I pray that you got something out of this lesson tonight to take the limits off God. Where you've been is not where God is going to leave you. He's got more in store for you. The hurt that you have experienced and that you've gone through, God's got better for you. He doesn't want you to be bittered by it. He wants you to be better through it by trusting in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your path. God will lead you. Take the limits off God. Take the limits off. Limits hold people back from going, and limits tell people they can't go any further. So people, there are some of you that are not moving at all because of limits that you put on yourself, limits that the devil said you have to be subject to. Some of you are moving forward, but you're afraid to move beyond it. The devil is a liar. God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If it's limits that's causing you to do nothing, paralyzed through analysis, if it's limits that's causing you to only go but so far, not going out of your comfort zone, the devil is a liar. Tonight's lesson is for you. Take the limits off God. We're getting ready to pray. My God, my God, because with all this word, we got to talk to God. I, I'm going to, take this to God because I feel in my spirit 
that there is something that's going on right now and the devil doesn't want you to move forward. The devil wants you to be stagnant. The devil wants you to be paralyzed. The devil wants you to be bound up by uncertainty, by doubt, by fear, by the lack of resources, by the lack of what you have, by your lack. Praise the name of God, but the devil is a liar. Tonight, we take the devil, we take the devil and make him run. Today, we put the devil on a run. Let's look to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this moment in your presence. Thank you for your word that has come to us tonight to take the limits off God. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word through the writing of the book of Ephesians. Lord God, a powerful little letter that was written to the saints of God from a man of God who was in prison. But Lord God, I'm so grateful that the prison bars did not stop him from soaring by faith that the prison circumstance did not hold his faith back from taking wings. And tonight, Lord God, we join in with such faith. We will not let our circumstances hold us captive. We will not let what is stop us from getting what is to come. Hallelujah unto the Lamb of God. We praise you because you have birthed us with purpose. You have birthed us with your anointing. You have birthed us, hallelujah, hey, God, so that come out of our mouths comes words of praise. Out of our mouths comes words of wisdom. Lord God, teach us, Lord, in what we're going through right now. I know that we're going through something, but Lord, we don't want to miss the lesson. Because if we miss the lesson, we'll miss the blessing. And so, God, I pray right now that every man, every woman, every young person that's listening, Lord God, would understand that whatever we're going through, there's a lesson in it and there's a blessing in it. And I bless you right now for it, Lord. I thank you. I don't want to miss either one. And I pray now, Lord God, that my brothers and sisters would do the same, that they would not miss the lesson. Sometimes we go through circumstances because we think we know better. Sometimes we go through problems because we are hiding things from leadership. Sometimes, Lord God, people get into circumstances that if they would have talked to their spiritual leader, they could have avoided it. Lord God, you put us in the body to be a blessing one to another. Everybody's got their position to play. Hallelujah! Everybody's got their spot to cover. Oh, God, we're a team in the Holy Ghost. We're a team, Jesus. Oh, hail, hail, Lion of Judah is our war cry. And tonight, Lord God, I pray that the faith of those listening was stirred up. Tonight, I pray, Lord God, that their appetite for more was stirred up, more of you, more of your word. Deeper, yet I pray, higher every day, wiser, blessed Lord, in thy precious holy word. Lord God, we want the breadth, we want the length, we want the depth, we want the height. Woo! Lord God, I speak it over them right now. Lord God, give them breath. Hallelujah. Give them length. Give them depth. Give them height. Show them the multidimensional power of your spirit at work in their lives to bring them to the fullness of what you have for them. I praise you right now, Lord God, that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. Those good things that you have prepared for those that love you, but you have revealed them unto us by the Holy Spirit. I praise you right now, Lord God, that you've given us your word. You've given us your promise. I praise you now, right now. I praise you now, right now. I praise you now, right now. Right now is the time of praise. Right now is the time of trust. Hey, hey, right now. Lord God, I praise you for a healing right now. I praise you for a direction right now. I praise you for an answer right now. I praise you for strength right now. I praise you for peace right now. Right now, I praise you for patience. Right now, I praise you for greater trust. Right now, greater wisdom. Right now, greater love. Right now, take us to the fullness. Take us to the fullness. Oh, God, and we give you praise right now. Lord God, I know that there are some that need a touch. And I pray right now, Lord God, that they receive that touch by faith. 
faith. Lord God, we reach out to you with our prayer, with our petition, but we praise you right now because we know you're a God that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. You are the can-do God. Woo! And as you are the can-do God, we are the will-praise people. Lord, we come with a will-praise to a can-do. Speak, Lord, by your Spirit. Help us to have ears to hear, Ooh, hearts to receive, and a willingness to obey. Come against the powers of darkness, the spirit of disobedience and rebellion. We come against the seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Lord God, we live holy because you tell us to live holy and you give us power to live holy. That's why the, the, the spirit is called a holy spirit. Uh, it's not a filthy spirit. It's not a cannot do spirit. It's a I can do all things through Christ's spirit. And so, Lord God, I thank you for the comfort that you give right now. I thank you for the peace that passes all understanding, that keeps our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I thank you for the rest that you give us because we are resting in you. And as we trust in the Lord, as we rest in your word, we know that all things are working together for good to them that love you, to them who are the called according to your purpose. And so now, Lord God, I pray that you would ever let your name, that we would ever yield to the name, that we would ever honor the name. I pray right now that every person under the sound of my voice would come to a deeper trust level, would come to a longer sustainability within themselves and strength level, that they will see the strength of God taking them a long way, that they'll be deep, Lord God, deeply rooted in your love, Lord God, that they will understand that the foundation and the banner over us is love. So now, Lord God, I pray this prayer over every heart and every home. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with you all now, henceforth and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. If you want to bless the ministry of Beulah Tabernacle, please feel free to do so. Whether it's through your faithful tithing or your free will offering, we invite you to sow into good ground. God is blessing according to his word. And when you line up your life and behavior with the word of God, the word will work for you. Taking us from a point of being on the outside and learning how to live by the principles of the kingdom on the inside. We're not on the outside looking in, and we're on the inside looking up. And so please feel free to support the ministry either through our website, through PayPal. You don't have to have a PayPal account uh, to use it um, through the traditional uh, method of mailing it to the Postal Service, the Beulah Tabernacle P.O. Box 100860, Brooklyn, New York, 11210-0806, or through our cash app, dollar sign Beulah Tab Rocks, in the name of the Lord, dollar sign Beulah Tab Rocks. If the Lord put it on your heart to support, please feel free to do so. Please do so. We are trusting God for great things, and we are asking that you be a part of it. In Jesus' name. And so now, my brothers and sisters, I offer this final prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and your family and give you all his peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. We love you. Thank God for you. Have a good night. In Jesus' name.